Welcome to SNC's podcast series, SNC Critical Insights. I'm Julie Jordan, co head of SNC's Labor and Employment Practice, and I'm joined today by Annie Ostrager, also a co head of our Labor and Employment Practice. On today's podcast, we will be focusing on critical issues employers are facing in the ever evolving legal landscape during the coronavirus pandemic. First, Annie will address the various executive orders being issued by various state and local governments to close non-essential businesses. And then I will address legal considerations for those employers who are still maintaining in-person work sites that employers should be mindful of. With that introduction, I will turn it over to Annie. Thank you, Julie. In the last week, as states and the federal government have taken action to combat the continued spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been evolving guidance on what constitutes an essential business not subject to otherwise applicable restrictions on who can report to work in person. California has been out in front on this, and on March 19th, California Governor Gavin Newsom issued an executive order mandating that all California residents stay home or at their place of residence, except as needed to maintain continuity of operations of the federal critical infrastructure sectors. Certain counties in California have even enacted stricter orders. And just yesterday, California issued additional guidance in the form of frequently asked questions addressing the designation of certain businesses and services as essential. On March 20th, New York enacted New York State on Pause, or policies that assure uniform safety for everyone. Like California, Pause contains an essential services exemption, which has been refined since initially announced on March 20th. In New York, essential services have been defined as including healthcare, which has a whole list of items underneath that exemption, including research, hospitals, clinics, emergency vet services, senior care, and other things. Essential infrastructure, which includes, among others, utilities, water services, and telephone and data centers. Essential manufacturing, including food processing and many other manufacturing services essential retail, including grocery stores, pharmacies, convenience stores, gas stations, restaurants and bars, but only for takeout or delivery, and other things, essential services like trash, mail, laundromats, building cleaning, and child care services. The news media covering this crisis is also exempt. And importantly, in New York, financial institutions, including banks and lending institutions, insurance, payroll, accounting, and then a catch-all under this bucket for services related to the financial market. Also exempt are providers of basic necessities to economically disadvantaged populations, including homeless shelters and food banks, construction and related services like electricians and plumbers and other businesses necessary to conduct emergency repairs and for safety purposes, defense functions and essential services like law enforcement, fire prevention and response, security, emergency management, including 911 and building cleaners, and then vendors that provide essential services or products to all of the above. New York has clarified that even essential businesses should only have employees report in person to the workplace if in-person attendance is necessary to provide the essential products or services. Essential businesses are still required to use telecommuting or work from home procedures to the maximum extent possible. New York has also clarified that non-essential businesses may have a single person attend a closed non-essential business temporarily to perform a specific task, like picking up the mail, as long as that person will not be in contact with anyone else. 
the current penalties for non-compliance with PAWS include mandatory business closure and civil fines, but do not at this time include fines to individuals. New Jersey, Connecticut, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and other states have put in place similar regimes. And just yesterday, on March 24th, the Treasury Secretary issued a statement endorsing and elaborating on the federal guidance issued by the Department of Homeland Security that identified financial services sector workers as essential critical infrastructure workers. Secretary Mnuchin stated, that the essential critical infrastructure workforce for the financial services sector includes workers who are needed to process and maintain systems for processing financial transactions and services such as payment, clearing, and settlement services, wholesale funding, insurance services, and capital activities. Essential financial services workers provide consumer access to banking and lending services, including ATMs and the movement of currency. They support financial operations, including data and security operations, and essential workers include key third-party providers who deliver core services. Notwithstanding these broad strokes guidance from states, and in some cases, localities and the federal government, regarding whether a business should be considered essential, the burden is generally on businesses to determine whether they qualify as essential, and we've been helping to navigate that issue for clients. In so doing, we've been able to look to various sources, including each state's guidance and instructive guidance from the Federal Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, which is a federal agency overseen by the Department of Homeland Security. CISA has issued general guidance designating critical infrastructure sectors, and in addition to its general guidance, issued on March 19th, coronavirus-specific guidance. While state and local governments are ultimately in charge of implementing and executing response activities, this guidance is informative, and some states have referenced it in their mandates. CISA's coronavirus-specific guidance states, among other things, that workers should be encouraged to work remotely whenever possible and focus only on core business activities. In-person, non-mandatory activities should be delayed until the resumption of normal operations. In addition, the guidance states that when continuous remote work is not possible, businesses should enlist strategies to reduce the likelihood of spreading the disease. CISA guidance says that everyone should follow guidance from the CDC, as well as state and local government officials, and also says that organizations should implement business continuity and pandemic plans and should not delay doing so. Even if a business correctly determines that it meets the threshold for designation as essential, the business then needs to determine which of its employees should report to the workplace and how to assist with their safe passage to the workplace. Businesses that determine they're essential or critical and are therefore permitted to continue operating may therefore want to provide safe passage letters to their employees who will continue to report to the office in person. Employees should be instructed to carry a copy of the letter to show to authorities in the event they are stopped en route to or from the office. Because of the rapid pace of developments in this area, employers may find it more feasible to issue a generic letter to those employees who will continue to report to the office, which could then be refined for certain critical personnel. In addition to safe passage letters for employees, businesses may also want to draft comfort letters to suppliers or vendors that they rely on for essential needs or services. While not all state and local guidance expressly exempt these entities, it follows that they must continue to operate, at least in part, in order to support the essential or critical businesses. To assist suppliers or vendors, essential businesses may want to provide a comfort letter to them that lays out the legal basis for their continued operation, explaining that specific supplies or services are necessary to the continued operation of the essential business. In addition to the various legal penalties for non-compliance, employers may want to consider other potential consequences of non-compliance with stay-at-home orders. 
For example, employees who believe their employers are misinterpreting the stay-at-home order and requiring employees to report in person to the workplace may report that employer to the authorities or to the media. Similarly, competitors who have determined that they are non-essential may report businesses that remain open either to the government or the press. Now I will turn it back to Julie, who will discuss legal implication for these essential and non-essential designations. Thanks so much, Annie. Now, assuming your business is considered essential or you're otherwise able to maintain an in-person workplace, I will now review some of the key guidance that has been issued by various federal regulators in response to the pandemic, and then employers who are continuing to maintain in-person workplaces should be mindful of. I will not be covering today the CDC guidance given the extensive coverage it has been given in the media. However, I will focus on regulatory guidance by OSHA, the Department of Labor, and the EEOC. First, turning to OSHA. On March 9th, which in today's world seems like years ago, given the significant developments in the world since then, OSHA issued comprehensive guidance on steps that every employer can take to reduce exposure to coronavirus in the workplace. Although the OSHA guidance does not set forth any new legal obligations, it contains advisory recommendations that can assist employers in complying with its duty to provide a safe working environment for employees during the pandemic. Among other things, OSHA suggests employers consider into which of four risk categories identified by OSHA, its workforce falls. And then OSHA suggests specific control measures that an employer should consider in implementing to address that risk. Those suggestions are too detailed to cover on today's podcast, but we provided a detailed description of those suggestions in a memorandum available on our firm website. Among the suggestions for all employers, whatever the nature of the risk to their particular workforce is to among other things, modify workers' schedules and tasks to minimize exposure, encourage flexible work arrangements, such as telecommuting, consider changing workplace schedules to minimize the number of workers who must be at the work site at one particular time, and provide a work environment that promotes personal hygiene and social distancing which by now I think we're all fully aware of means being at least six feet away from one another. Second, the Department of Labor. On March 9th, the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division issued guidance on common issues that an employer may face in responding to the pandemic under both the Fair Labor Standards Act or the FLSA and the Family and Medical Leave Act or FMLA. That guidance, among many things, confirms the ability of employers to send home sick employees, the ability of employers under the ADA to seek medical information from employees who seek to return to the workforce who had been out sick with the virus. But in doing so, they encourage employers to keep in mind that healthcare resources may be overwhelmed and it may be difficult for employees to obtain that medical information or documentation. The guidance also underscores the need of employers to apply any policy or procedure adopted in response to the pandemic in a uniform, neutral, and non-discriminatory manner. The guidance also addresses payment to employees in the event of a sudden business closure, including the obligation under the FLSA to only pay hourly employees for hours worked, not the hours that the employee would have worked absent that closure, and the general obligation to pay exempt employees their full salary in any week in which they perform any work. It is important to note that some of the March 9th guidance has now been superseded for those employers with fewer than 100 employees given last week's enactment of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act or the FFCRA. That bill is scheduled to go into effect on April 1. Among other things, the March 9th guidance had stated that there was no obligation under federal law to provide private sector employees with leave to take care of kids home from school because of the pandemic. As of April 1, however, 
under the FFCRA, that is no longer the case for small and mid-sized employers. The FFCRA expands the FMLA to provide leave to employees unable to work or telework because of the need to care for a son or daughter under 18 years old. It also includes an Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, the first ever federal paid sick time mandate that entitles covered employees to paid sick leave under various coronavirus related circumstances. We have a separate podcast that provides a more detailed overview of that particular legislation. Third, I'll provide an overview of recent guidance issued by the EOC. The EOC has stressed to employers that the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act continue to apply in this pandemic, but they specifically advise employers that those legal obligations do not interfere with employers' ability to follow advice from the CDC and other public health authorities. Among other things, the latest guidance from the EOC provides, first, employers may send employees with coronavirus or symptoms of coronavirus home. Second, it provides an ADA compliance survey that can be provided to employees to anticipate employee absenteeism so employers can prepare accordingly. Third, it provides that given the CDC and other health authorities have now acknowledged community spread of COVID-19, employers may measure employees' body temperature. In doing so, the guidance notes that as with any medical information of an employee, that it is still subject to ADA confidentiality requirements. The guidance also recognizes that given the extraordinary circumstances we are in, discussing accommodation requests and providing accommodations under the ADA may result in certain delays, but encourages employers to address these requests as soon as possible and to consider using interim solutions to enable employees to keep working with modified arrangements as much as possible. The guidance also provides guidance on the hiring of new employees, including advising that under current CDC guidance, an employer at this time may delay the start date of an applicant who has a virus or symptoms associated with it. It also states an employer may screen job applicants for symptoms of COVID-19 after making a conditional job offer, as long as it does so for all entering employees in the same type of job, and that an employer can withdraw a job offer when it needs the applicant to start immediately, but the individual has the virus or symptoms of it. That concludes today's podcast. Of course, today, given time constraints, we only provided you with highlights of certain legal issues being faced by employers in today's ever-changing legal landscape. You can find more detailed information on the issues discussed today at our website, saltcrom.com, under Coronavirus SNC Update. We also encourage you to subscribe to our blog, which has been quite active these days, entitled Legal Developments Affecting the Workplace by clicking on the provided link. Thank you for listening to SNC Critical Insights. Be safe and well.